how proteins are made. To begin with, um, we watched a video in class, which I would encourage you if you really want to, you can Google it and watch it yourself if you missed the day that we watched it. I'm not going to watch it right now. So first we're going to talk about the structure and function of DNA. And in order to do that, we need to talk about how it is that something can code for information. So in talking about the function of DNA, scientists started to ask what macromolecule can make up genetic information? and which macromolecules can ho hold our code of life. So if we think about it, the English language is made up of 26 letters that are put together in special orders to make words. These words are then put together to make sentences, and through sentences, we're able to convey information. Our genetic code is very similar to this whole process. You may also be familiar with Morse code, which is made up of dits, which are sh short sounds, and da's, which are long sounds. So for instance, um, SOS, when it's tapped on the side of a boat, can mean that somebody needs help. Again, it's letters or symbols that represent words that convey a message. So in Morse code, there are only two symbols, but when you arrange them in a special order, they're able to convey ideas. So the code of living things is a little bit different. Living things are made out of molecules and living things are able to pass traits onto their offspring. So these molecules are arranged in a certain order in order to pass on traits. So let's think back. What are the four macromolecules that we talked about in class? And which of these molecules could possibly code for hereditary information? Why might you think that that one can code for hereditary information? So let's review. The macromolecules that we talked about were carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. If you remember, carbohydrates were made up of the elements carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, as was lipids. Remember, carbohydrates were in the proportion of CH2O. Remember, carbohydrate meaning water. Lipids had carbon, hydrogen, and just a little bit of oxygen. Proteins had carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Remember, protein started with P and P protein had no P. And nucleic acids had carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. The monomers that made up carbohydrates were monosaccharides. Remember, small units that repeated several times in order to make much larger molecules. Lipids were made up of three fatty acids and one glycerol. Proteins were made up of amino acids and nucle nucleic acids were made up of nucleotides. So which of these could possibly make our code of life? Well, if we think about carbohydrates, they're usually the same unit, for instance, glucose, that's repeating over and over and over and over and over again. So think about it. You have a keyboard and there's one letter on it, and all you can do is press that one letter, for instance, A. If you turned in a sheet full of A's to your teacher, would they accept that as an essay? I don't think so. There's not much code there. Lipids are made up of glycerols and fatty acids. Again, not too much of a code. There's only two symbols or two different letters that could be used to possibly code for genetic information. When we start to talk about proteins, it starts to sound a little bit like a language. Proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. And scientists started to suspect that proteins were the code of life. They also started to look at nucleic acids, and they know that nucleic acids are made up of nucleotide monomers, and the nucleotide monomers contain sugar, phosphate, and nitrogenous base. Further, they noticed that there were four different nitrogenous bases, mainly A, C, T, and G, and we'll learn in a little bit what those stand for. So they also thought nucleic acids could possibly make up our code of life. So of the four macromolecules, scientists determined that proteins or nucleic acids could be genetic material. Both were complex enough to carry a code or information that would in turn create life. So a little bit of history of DNA. And it's really important that you know these scientists as they will show up on the SOL and they are fairly recent scientists, which make them even more important for us to know. So if you take a look at this, um, you'll notice that in 1953, Watson and Crick 
accurately described the model of the DNA as a double helix. They also received a Nobel Prize for this. And in 1966, the genetic code was revealed, meaning that they determined for every three nucleotide bases, there was one amino acid produced. We'll talk a little bit more about this in the next couple days. In 1972, the DNA composition of humans was found to be 99% similar to chimpanzees and gorillas. We were even more closely related to chimps and gorillas than monkeys were to chimps and gorillas. Again, really important. In 1990, the Human Genome Project was launched, and basically what they wanted to do was sequence the entire human genome, meaning all of the genes in humans. And in 2002, the project was completed. It's important to note that the Human Genome Project didn't specifically look at any type of mutations or disabilities, just where the traits were in the genes. So the scientists that you need to know. The first one is Shargraf. And he discovered that the number of C's was equal to the number of G's, and the number of A's were equal to the number of T's in DNA, meaning that G pairs with C and A pairs with T. So if we know the number of A's, then we know the number of T's. He gave us our base pairing rules. In the early 1950s, there was a scientist named Rosalind Franklin, who I have mentioned before in class, and most of you, I think, will remember her a little bit. Rosalind Franklin used x-rays um, after she had put DNA into crystal form to figure out how it was put together. She took pictures uh, using x-ray crystallography and um, took a famous picture known as photo 51, which if you're looking at the screen right now is in the lower right hand corner. This photo 51 was basically the photo that confirmed what Watson and Crick suspected was that DNA was a double helix. Before Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize for um, discovering that DNA was a double helix, Rosalind Franklin actually passed away from cancer due to x-ray radiation. Rosalind Franklin's not credited with much of the discovery of DNA. However, she was an integral part in it, and photo 51 is one that you should be familiar with. In 1952, Linus Pauling and Jerry Donahue determined the bond types and angles that make up DNA. This was important because this is what gave us a little bit more information regarding the shape of DNA. And in 1953, Watson and Crick um, combined their data to create a three-dimensional model of the structure of DNA. They called this a double helix. They're the ones that are credited with the double helix, so it's important to note that on the SOL, if they asked you who discovered the double helix model of DNA, it would be Watson and Crick and not Franklin. 